we have these lovely blocks, and you know that they each are named for the what that they're filling. Talk about it at your table. What I'm doing here is asking you to be careful with your terminology. They are named for the what in which electrons are being added. Discuss at your table. They're named for the subshell in which they're filling. Are they, fill, are they putting electrons in an F subshell, either 4F or 5F? Are they putting electrons in a D subshell, like 3D or 4D? Are they putting electrons in an S subshell, like 1S, 2S, etc.? That's how we get these block names. Okay, now the teaser that we've talked about a little earlier in the year is the fact that where the electrons are going completely determines how they behave, how they work and play with others. So you might think based on that that there would be certain characteristics by block, and you'd be right. And I think we started to talk about this a little bit yesterday, correct? We did a little bit with the S block. What I want to show you is a video of S block elements. Note that it says they are reactive. What does that mean? They react with other materials. Yeah, they react with other elements. That's all it means. It's really simple. It's a chemical property. And it's because of their electron arrangement. So let's um, shift to a quick YouTube video. Okay. Um, stick your hand on the P block. Excellent. This and the S block together we call main group. Um, and the main group periodic trends are real easy. We said in the S block, the number of valence electrons is the same as the group number. Here it's a little bit different because the number of electrons is equal to group number minus 10. We skip over that 3 through 12 for now. We're going to talk about those in a second. That's the D block. So let's do a little bit of practice. By, by Christmas break, you are going to be so proficient that I can say, boom, sulfur, how many valence electrons? And you'll go, oh, two. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> That's the ion it forms. Six. <laughs> you'll, you'll know that instantly. Okay, and that'll be really important in the second half of the year when we're doing a lot of equation work. So these things tend to, well, they're a mixed bag in terms of giving up and gaining electrons. But group 18 is super stable because they've got that full P. Group 18 are the what? Noble gases. They've got a full S and P on the highest occupied main energy level. In the P block, the properties vary. So in the S block, we said they're all reactive. They all react with water. They all react with air. In the P block, it's not so certain. We have some things that are relatively stable. We have some things that are highly reactive. The P block has all the nonmetals in the periodic table except for one. What did we say about hydrogen and helium? They are weirdos. They're kind of exceptions to a couple of rules. They're the original elements, and so they kind of break some rules. Hydrogen is considered a nonmetal even though it's in group one. All the metalloids, sometimes called semi-metallics, um, are in the P block. The halogens are in the P block. So the P block contains things, it's got a few things that are metals, it's got a few things that are metalloids, and it's got all the non-metals. That's pretty diverse. I mean, of, of the groups of elements we talked about, that's three of the four, because we've talked about metals, non-metals, metalloids, and we sometimes talk about lanthanides and actinides. But um, that's a pretty diverse block. Okay. So now, stick your finger on the D block. This is that middle ground, that dropped section. These are known as transition metals. And when we say, so remember that sodium is a metal, calcium is a metal, magnesium is a metal. But when you say metal, this is what you think of. This is your irons and coppers and nickels and golds, cobalt, all those things. There are deviations from the orbital filling pattern and the subshell filling pattern. There are crossovers because of the fact that we have those d orbitals. And if you look at the group number, 
It's the sum of the uppermost occupied energy level electrons in the S plus those D. So look at group 5. How many D electrons are there in any of them? Should be 3, right? Because whether we're here and we've gone um, 4s1, 4s2, 3d1, 2, 3, or whether we're here and we've gone 5s1, 5s2, 4d1, 2, 3, the group number is equal to the sum of those s and d's. That becomes important when we start to talk about the way that they form ions. What about this group? What's the, how many D electrons would you find? Sum of the S and the D is 11. You've got 4S1, 4S2, 3D, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Sum of the outer S and the D is going to give you your group number. Because of the fact that you have these weird overlapping patterns, what you tend to see are multiple ions that are formed. And we're going to talk more about that in the next chapter, but that's sort of a, a red herring clue. Well, not red herring, no, that's the wrong literary term. It's foreshadowing is what it is, um, of the fact that we're going to see multiple ion patterns. Those transition metals are great conductors. We don't have, the wiring in our house is not made of calcium for a reason, though calcium's conductive. It's not made of... Chlorine, for a reason, the transition metals are excellent conductors of electricity. And when we get into bonding in the next chapter, we're going to start to talk about why that is in terms of their electron arrangement. But the fact that they have those overlaps with those weird D electrons that kind of float around, that's a clue as to why they're such good conductors. They tend to be very hard, and they tend to be shiny. Um, these things are not nearly as reactive as the alkali and alkali earth metals. There are some of them that are actually so non-reactive that they are found in their pure, pure form. Look at the D block. Find one element there that you know of that is found in its pure form in nature. Um, gold is very non-reactive. Palladium is one you're probably not going to see a whole lot of. Platinum is another one. Silver to a lesser degree. Um, boom. Silver to a lesser degree. But gold is the big one. And you can, um, I actually knew a guy when I worked at Pima Tuning State Park, there was a guy on the maintenance crew who had spent, I don't know, like five years from 19 until 20 something mining gold out west. <laughs> he decided he was going to go mine gold. He became a gold miner went out west and was, it's not quite like panning streams, it's not like the old prospector videos that you've seen, but um, he was using some pretty high-tech tools because gold flecks will show up in streams. You can have a seam of gold and you can actually find chunks of gold because it doesn't form compounds. It's non-reactive. Um, they use it in the body. What's going on in your body? Okay, lots of things. But there are a whole lot of ions, there are a whole lot of chemicals circulating in your bloodstream at all times. You can stick gold in the bloodstream and it will not react with the chemicals in the bloodstream. It will not react with the sodium and chloride ions and the potassium ions and the other things that are in your cells that end up in your bloodstream. It will not react with the um, oxygen in your bloodstream because it's that non-reactive. And I, I worked with a woman who's, okay, hand on your heart. There's a big tube leading up out of the heart. What's that called? Large artery. Aorta. Yes. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> You've had to know all this, haven't you, recently? Um, if the wall of the aorta gets thin and balloons out, that's called an aortic aneurysm. It's very dangerous because it can pop, and that is high-pressure blood, highest-pressure blood in the body, and you die pretty quickly if your aorta ruptures. Aortic rupture is pretty immediately fatal. So he had an aortic aneurysm, a bubble in the sidewall of the aorta. The way they fix that is they put in a mesh supporting structure to reinforce it. The structure they put in place is a gold mesh. So she used to joke that her, her dad had a heart of gold. Literally. 
Um, because gold is so non-reactive, it can actually be placed right into the bloodstream and it will not react, which is kind of cool. Okay, the F block. Um, these are things that are filling up 4 and 5 F orbitals. We don't know of anything that... Okay. We don't know of anything at the present time that is filling in a 6F or 7F or anything higher than that. We don't know of things that are filling in G orbitals. Does that mean they can't exist? No. Um, we don't know of them in our universe. There are multiple universes. That's what the physics seems to suggest at this point. Um, we assume the rules are the same throughout those universes, throughout what we call the multiverse. But as far as we know, we have not encountered anything yet that fills above a 5F in the Fs. These are called lanthanide and actinide series based on lanthanium and actinium. And if you look at your periodic table, and so if you can look at the short form and long form side by side, you'll notice something. There's a little bit of a discrepancy in where they cut off and take out the F series. And I don't have a good answer. I should actually email Van Brainer, who developed this periodic table. But you'll notice on the short form, LA and AC are shown in the D block, though they're really part of the F block. And on the long form, they're shown as F block, which is where they belong. Do you guys have your long form? So notice that discrepancy. Just be aware of it. And the only way to really know if something's F block or D block, if we're talking about that, that wiggle fudge room, is to count electrons. See where it's filling. If it's filling in an F, it's F block. If it's filling in a D, it's D block. And I don't know why the guy who developed the table allowed that sort of discrepancy to stand, but, you know. The lanthanides are highly reactive, much like the alkali metals, alkali earth metals. I always get those two mixed up. Actinides are all radioactive. Look at that bottom row at the, at the actinides. You got thorium, pascalium, what's U? Uranium. Um, we have a lot of the, the big players there. Now that's not to say that the stuff in the lanthanide series, that none of them are reactive, because many of them are. Many of the F-block materials are, are radioactive. They're huge nuclei. And we talked very, very briefly, just in passing, and we'll mention it again when we talk more about forces and binding. Um, the force that holds the nucleus together, those are what? Do you remember? Why aren't the protons in the nucleus all being pushed apart? So really, it's about as creative an answer, about as creative as a name as atomic mass units. The nucleus, the Particles in the nucleus are held together by nuclear forces. <laughs> yes, nuclear forces. Um, when you get to a certain point, nuclear forces can't overcome proton-proton repulsion. And you get unstable nuclei, and they break down, they decay, and that's radioactivity. And when we get into the lanthanides and actinides, these are pretty big nuclei. So the bigger the nuclei, the more likely it is that a, an element is radioactive. 